Welcome to You Talks, brought to you by State of Youth. Uh, welcome everyone to this new episode of uh, Youth Talks, uh, the very own State of Youth podcast. Uh, I will be your host today. I'm Ludovica Del Vecchio and I'm the project manager for State of Youth. I'm very excited to be here talking to Cristina Adane. She's one of the finalists for this year's International Children's Peace Prize. How are you, Cristina? I'm good. I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for giving us the time. So, uh, can you explain to us why you were nominated for the International Children's Peace Prize in the first place? Yeah, so I was nominated um, for my work in the food uh, system in the UK, particularly the free school meal campaign that I launched back in April 2020 when I um, started a petition to get the government to um, provide free school meal provisions over the May half term and then that blew up into a national campaign. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I end my work with Bite Back 2030. We can get into that later. Yeah, wow. And how old are you? Can you remind I'm me? I'm 18 now, just turned 18. So oh, happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice. And um, what does it mean for you to be nominated for the International Children's Peace Prize? Uh, I cried. So some of, you, some of you saw me cry. Um, it meant a lot. I I didn't expect it at all. Um, and I think I've spoken about this before, but I have like a lot of imposter syndrome because I just don't really uh, think I deserve like a lot of the accolades I get. Just yeah. yeah. Um, and so getting this nomination is just insane because it's like okay, maybe I really do you know, deserve this, but it's, yeah, incredible, feels amazing. Well, if I can tell you, you really do, <laughs> you really <laughs> do you. deserve it. Thanks. And uh, I wanted to go into the um, petition and the free school meals. Uh, I know that the petition got more than 430,000 signatures. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think made it so successful? The universal story behind it, uh, when I wrote uh, the reasoning behind the petition. So when you click on it, you see my story, essentially. Um, that story was relatable to loads of people across the UK. And the shame around it and the stigma around um, free school meals was something that we all had to grow up with. Whether you were 30, 50, whether you were 17, 18, we all know the feeling of, you know, like going into school and not knowing whether you're going to have a lunch because you're too afraid to speak up. And so the fact that I finally spoke up, I think ignited something with so many people because they were like, I went through that too. And you know, that shouldn't happen. So yeah, I think it, I think it, it finally, you know, started destigmatizing the conversation. And so people, you know, just stood up in unity um, and in solidarity with the young people of the UK and what they're going through, so. Nice, that's very nice. Um, it was very successful, but at the same time, did you have any challenges that you had to overcome during your activism? Yes, many. Um, the free school meal position is obviously one thing. I do loads more yeah. campaigning. Um, and I guess one of the biggest obstacles is just getting people to listen and understand why it's not like the, the child or the parent's fault. A lot of people, when they talk about food and working class, like people, people in poverty, immediately say it's the parents' fault, it's the parents' fault. Um, or the parents are lazy, they can't afford to feed their kids. It's not about that, right? And having to deal with that was quite tough for me because it's like, I know what the truth is and I know the facts and I know from personal experience that, that that's not the case. Um, but yeah, I think, I think having to um, stay true to the story and stay true to um, myself and what I know and just sharing that and being positive whilst doing that and not feeding into all the hate. It was difficult, but I, I think I definitely went through it and it was a learning curve, so. Yeah, yeah, of course. And do you have any advice for any young activist or change maker or even someone that is young and wants to do something but doesn't know how to start and with what to start. You know, sometimes it's so overwhelming to see all of this issue in the world that 
are not okay. Yeah, there's there's loads of advice I would give. Um, one of them being just do it and just start because sometimes we talk so much about these issues, but it's like we don't do anything because we're so uh, kind of struck by what's going on and struck by the fear of speaking out that we don't. So just go for it, be confident. Um, and your voice uh, obviously matters, but people won't care that you like people don't like people don't look at you and think oh like she's da, 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 da. all the voices in your head about like your voice not being important or people making fun of you that's not going to happen right if you speak up they're going to hear your message and and that's what's important when i speak up even when i'm in a room and i feel like i'm completely just like not relevant i have to remember that i'm here because of the message that i'm bringing and i'm i i have something very important to say and people need to hear it and it's not about me it's about the wider issue so when young people speak up, I'd say, think the same, like you are so experienced and you have expertise with the particular issue that you're fighting for. So bring that message forward. It's not, don't, don't get lost in your head and don't, uh, yeah, just, just don't afraid, be afraid to be vulnerable and be confident, yeah. That was very nice and powerful, thank you. And um, one last question about the past and then we're gonna talk about the present and the future. Um, if you look back, is there anything that you would do differently? Definitely. Um, I, because I started campaigning when I was around 15 and then when the petition happened I was 16. Yeah. So I was exposed to a very large audience, <laughs> the whole of the UK, um, at a young age. And it came with a lot of pressure and a lot of people wanting things, you know, please speak here, please do this, please do that. And I've had an amazing support system that said, you know, you don't have to do, we don't want to, but I felt like I had to. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself from a very young age to do what everyone wants and be who everyone wants to be. And I would have said no a lot more to a lot of things and um, prioritized myself and my family. Um, my, my, my family knows I was stuck in my room during lockdown, just like, 24 seven, um, sometimes I wouldn't even talk to them, which is crazy because we're in the same house um, because I was so busy and I wish I didn't and I had time to myself. So definitely learn to prioritize certain things at certain times and have a balance yeah. because campaigning is like, you feel like you have to fix the world and like there's so many issues going on. So you feel like you just have to do everything, but there's, I was, um, Vanessa Nakato, who's like one of my favorite um, climate activists, she's incredible. Um, I was on a call with her and she said, I asked her, how do you like deal with it? Because I struggle myself sometimes and she's incredible. And she said, um, when I need to rest or when I need a break, I know that you're gonna speak up. And when you take a break, I know that, you know, I'm gonna speak up. And so it's a very much a collective team effort. And so it's very much, um, think of it as we and not I. Like it's not just me as a campaigner, it's us as campaigners and as change makers. So that helps too. To think about a community exactly. that is doing, you know, what you're doing maybe in different respects. But exactly. uh, oh, that's very nice. I never, yeah, that's awesome. Good. And um, yeah, so there was my questions about, you know, the past and uh, what you were nominated for. But I know that right now you're working on junk food. Yeah. And I know that actually when you started also your activism, you were very, very much invested in environmental issues. Yeah. Can you maybe explain to me and to us what is the relation between environmental issues and junk food? Yeah, sure. Um, so... It's funny because when I started doing climate activism, uh, I immediately looked at my diet and what I was eating and how that contributed to um, climate. And obviously, you know, eating a burger that takes tons of water consumption and the meat is imported from halfway across the world. I was seeing on a very small level how it was affecting me. And that's how I joined Bite Back actually, because I was having those conversations and then uh, my manager at the time who I was doing work experience with said you should join bite back they're doing this blah 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 um, anyway I knew from a very like from the very beginning that there was a connection but I didn't really fully understand it but the more I've been campaigning um, 
but in both worlds, the more evident it's becoming, specifically with junk food. The food miles, the deforestation, um, the fact that you, everything's just ultra processed, ultra, every piece of, um, you know, the climate movement that everyone talks about, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be um, food miles, whether it be, uh, you know, land degradation, it all connects to food, all of it. And when people do talk about oil and gas and all the huge things that are affecting the climate, no one ever talks about what the food system's doing. Um, and it's been really interesting for me coming from the food angle, seeing how those same processes and those same foods damage our health. And so for me, it's like, okay, junk food damages our health and um, it's really, really bad for you know young people's development. It's also really bad for the climate. Why don't we promote eating healthy? Why don't we promote you know greener, cleaner foods? Um, so we're doing a lot of work uh, on that and trying to understand how we approach a sustainability campaign because the food system is broken and it affects the two biggest things, which is our health and the planet. Yeah. And so the way we fix it has to be from an intersectional approach. It has to be holding two of these things to account. Um, and so, yeah, we've been talking to loads of different organizations, trying to work with them, um, trying to see the advice that they're giving, like sustain UNICEF. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, but it's also, you need to be very uh, open-minded and aware. Okay. So we're approaching it in terms of marketing yeah. We recently won, um, uh, we passed in a bill in government to announce uh, the banning of junk food marketing uh, online and on TV before 9pm, which is obviously incredible. And that alone will um, give young people in the next decade 270,000 years of extra life, oh, wow. which is insane. Also, uh, to, to give you an idea, because I don't think people understand when I talk about yeah. junk food, like it's just like, what junk food? Like that, it doesn't seem important, right? Um, the marketing is to young people under 18, 16 billion ads per year, which is 500 ads per second wow. on each child's phone, which is an in insane. Um, and so I think, although we like to uh, not really think about food because we have it three times a day, it's just like a way of life. We really need to think about how it affects us and obviously the world around us. Absolutely. And um, is this part of your future plans? Can you tell me a little bit more about your future plans? Also maybe with Bite Back? Yeah, so we're launching a sustainability campaign soon. Um, we're obviously doing work around COP. We've got uh, a panel in October coming up. Nice. But um, we, we're also trying to do longer term projects. We're thinking about factory farming specifically and how factory farming, how we could ban maybe the advertising around that. Mm -hmm. It's a big ask because, you know, like the, these people rule the world, the, these massive companies. But if we could stop um, them having a platform to show these foods, then we hope it would reduce consumption and we could, you know, make some noise around it. So the, the in terms of that campaign, the future's looking very interesting. Um, in terms of myself in the future, I want to take a gap year. Um, I want to study anthropology after that um, and just continue campaigning. Uh, I'm very young and I forget that a lot of the time. Like I haven't actually devoted my full time to just doing what I love. Yeah. School's always been like in the way um, and I've had to prioritize it. So, and just like looking at the change I've been able to make as, as part-time campaigner, like I'd, I'd love to see what I could do full-time and obviously travel. Um, so yeah, it's still up in the air. I don't know what I want to do long-term, but excited. Sounds good in the yeah. meantime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, I read somewhere uh, that uh, you felt very lucky in being in the generation that you are in. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit why you feel that way? I agree, but <laughs> why would you feel that way? Um, because there's so much uh, awareness around issues, not only awareness, but um, young people making noise and, and, and actually making change around things. But in an approach where it's, as I said before, the we approach, where it's like, 
Uh, I'm an a activist for racial justice, for climate justice, for um, food justice, and I'm able to do that with all these people around me that, like, we have different experiences, but we all are passionate about the same things and we all are very empathetic. And I think campaigning alongside, like even just being able to say, you know, people like Greta Thunberg and Vanessa, Vanessa and all these incredible names are from my generation, but also like the young people at Bite Back and just the, the friends that I have on a day-to-day -day basis and how conscious they are and how like, just, the, the empathy and the um, willingness to change and, and do better, I really, really admire. Um, and I'm always inspired by young people, the young people around me, you know, like who keep me going, even just like my, my little siblings and seeing how curious they are and how much they want to help as well. I think we need to preserve, preserve that innocence and preserve that like um, drive to, to do change because I don't know what happens but somewhere along the line adults just <laughs> get corrupted so, so we need to preserve that I think yeah absolutely I agree 100% that's very nice so you um, petitioned the UK government to make a change at, at the same time I know that you also work within your community in a community center to help firsthand do you think that this approach on both sides is necessary and fundamental to achieve change? 100%. Um, I think that's a very, very key and important point, um, that change happens bottom up. Yeah. Um, and you can do a lot top down. You can you know, lobby all you want and talk about corporate activism and you know, getting companies to change their ways, but until there's a youth quake, until there's a consensus from the bottom that something has to change and we come together, they're not going to listen and um, you're not going to incite the real change that you want to see. Um, but also just, you know, not everything has to be big. Sometimes just changing one person's life is enough. And that's why I love like my community um, and especially with the free school meal campaign. I got to see, you know, the, the change that I was talking about in meetings and to parliament in real life. Yeah. And I, it, 10 minutes away from me, there are young people that are literally receiving like food boxes because of what I did, which is, I mean, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it needs both, um, but young people, young change makers shouldn't be focused on government and shouldn't be focused on corporates. I think you have to start small. Mm -hmm. And that's where the really important change is. Ensuring that your community are supported is what it's all about. No matter what policy, whatever, whatever happens yeah. in Parliament, it's about that community. Um, and that's who it affects. So you need to keep your focus there and ensure that you never lose them on the journey. They, they're supposed to be with you throughout. Um, and you're speaking for them as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I have one last question. Um, we talked, we touched upon this um, before in our answers, in our, in our chat. Um, do you think that intersectionality in activism is important? Being yourself, you know, black young woman growing up in a challenging part of London, you know, like how much intersectionality in activism? Uh, yeah, I think it's very, very important. And um, for me, it was difficult at first because I fell into a victim mentality. Like I used my identity to be the victim. Like, oh, I'm a black woman, so I'm at the bottom of society. Um, I'm an immigrant, so da, da, da. all my parents, you know, haven't gone to uni, so. And it was very easy to just feel like yeah, the victim, but it's your power and, and the fact that you are able to empathize with so many different people and you know what it's like to, to be disadvantaged in, in a certain aspect of life or, you know, you know, um, or you can understand the experiences and struggles that other people have to go through. That empathy is very um, important and I think that's why intersectionality is so important because you reach out to people 
that you probably wouldn't have spoken to or, or, or you know, um, communicated with otherwise, and you work with them. And I think Kimberly Crenshaw, um, I mean, I love her, um, but I think that sometimes corporates use that word in the wrong sense and people love to use it as just like, oh, like, take an intersectional approach. It's much deeper than that. It's actually like how you wholly look at the system. And um, if you're asking for policy change, like, and I always want to improve this with Bite Back, we need to look at how food is, isn't just about junk food. It's also about racial justice, why black people are more likely to be obese, why, um, and we've started that with climate, w w with what I said about sustainability, but even um, how, how are men affected versus women? How is this community affected? And, and look at the whole picture. And um, I think that's why different people's experiences are so important. So definitely, um, and, and using, using your experiences as a power rather than as something to belittle you. Like the word minority, for example, is just like, it's difficult because it's like, I'm not a minority, yeah, I'm so the majority. True. Yeah. So um, it's all about mindset. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Is there something that you want to add to what we talked about or some last words that you want to give to our change maker that are listening from all over the world? Yeah, I think um, don't give up hope and always be confident and consistent. Uh, your voice does matter and even if it feels like it doesn't at times it, it, it's there and people are listening at least one person is listening and looking at you and that's all that matters um, if you are able to incite change and change one person's mind that's enough um, so yeah keep doing you uh, so with this inspiring words we're gonna conclude this uh, today's episode and um, thank you so much guys for tuning in and for listening to us today and um, yeah. bye bye <laughs> thanks for having me bye. <laughs>